the central theme of Toledo history from, say, 1800 down to the Civil War is uh, the, the development of an urban frontier, the development of, uh, or the effort to develop an urban valley. There are speculators, town promoters here, before uh, there are any farmers or, or anybody else. The, uh, the town is kind of the nucleus of uh, the development of the whole region. So you can't really think of uh, Toledo growing as a result of the, the development of an area. It's, it's a plan kind of development. And I think we somewhat ignore this notion of the urban frontier. We think of uh, the place in its early years as kind of a raw, primitive settlement, a few uh, trappers and Indians about. But, but actually, the first people on the scene were, were very urbane, uh, well-to-do uh, land speculators. Much of the early development in Ohio is taking place either along Lake Erie in the Connecticut Western Reserve area or down along the Ohio River or again up some of the other rivers flowing into either of these bodies of water. Uh, Chillicothe was the early capital of Ohio and that really is considered being southern Ohio today. Uh, Cincinnati was uh, of course established by this time. Marietta, our first community at the mouth of the Muskingum River along the Ohio River. And again up on Lake Erie you had Cleveland. Now in northwest Ohio there was no settlement whatsoever. We had the barrier of the notorious and infamous Black Swamp. And not only did we have the Black Swamp which acted as a barrier to early settlement in this part of the state, uh, at the time of the Treaty of Greenville, which followed the Battle of Fallen Timbers, fought here along the Maumee River, the Indians were allowed to retain a portion of what is today Ohio, and it seems that that portion they were permitted to retain happened to be largely northwest Ohio. And consequently, in our part of the state, there was very little except the swamps, the insects, and of course scattered Indian villages. After the uh, Battle of Fallen Timbers, the Treaty of Greenville had uh, deeded much of the land in northwestern Ohio to the Indians, keeping, I believe there were 16 military reserves where soldiers could stay and where people could go in. So the American people who settled here came into the 12-mile uh, square reserve for the most part. So after the War of 1812, when the British were finally gone, and also Tecumseh died at the end, toward the end of the battles in northwestern Ohio during the War of 1812, and this sort of ended the Indians' conspiracy against the settlers. And so it was safer to be here. And uh, the government decided they didn't really need the fort anymore. They didn't need the reserve, and they didn't really need Fort Miggs anymore. So they arranged for it to be sold to the public. And the first land sale was um, in the spring of 1817, I believe. This is a time, you have to imagine, when uh, the largest single, what they called internal improvement, is going to be built through this part of the country. Toledo and much of the, of the we were known as the West, much of the area west of here was built and settled by land speculators who came here to make money. And when they found out that there was a canal going through here, uh, there were years that were just wild with development. Land prices soared. People did make a lot of money uh, in those early days. Uh, the Cincinnati Martin Baum came up from, or his company, the Port Lawrence Company, came up from Cincinnati. Jessup Scott was an early land speculator. Now, I think the uh, the most notable figure in the uh, the early history of uh, of Toledo is probably Jessup Scott. He's well enough known. He's given his name to a high school and uh, is known as the founder of the University of Toledo, Scott Park campus. But I don't think his real role in the city is quite appreciated as uh, a representative of this uh, kind of speculative uh, activity. Uh, Scott clearly was one of the, uh, the leading promoters. In 1832, Jessup Scott was living in Erie or here in counties in a town named Florence. 
And he came to Toledo to look at the land here because he had long felt that there would be an important city that would grow up at this end of Lake Erie. And he was interested in being involved in that. So he came to take a look at the land and he purchased 70 acres, which was all he could afford. He'd like to have bought more, but he didn't have enough money. And the 70 acres included the sites of the main library and the courthouse, and I think the LaSalle's corner, much of the, the best part of the downtown. So he went back and told his wife what he had done, and he said it will be worth $20,000 in 20 years. And she said, sure and laughed. And so he began immediately to try to sell the land to other people and, and make a profit and get back some of his investment. One of the people that he tried to sell the land to was his brother. And he took his brother on a tour of the property to try to convince him that this really was going to be the center of the developing city. And as they're jumping from bog to bog in the swamp, and it was all grown up, I suppose the grass was tall and the trees and the brush, and it's very marshy and wet, they were in the vicinity of the courthouse, when, which of course wasn't there then, when they suddenly realized they didn't know how they had gotten there or which way to go to get out. There were no paths or roads or anything through the swamp. And so as they're standing there wondering, now what do we do, a steamer went by on the river, a boat getting ready to dock, and it blew its whistle and they knew then which direction the river was, so they were able to walk out of the swamp and get onto higher ground and to safety. So they, the brother did not buy the property. But it was worth $20,000 in 20 years. Towns sprang up all along uh, the river banks, most of them on paper. It's what they call paper towns. They were actually platted, surveyed, laid out on paper. But they never really became realities. Austerlitz, Marengo, Lucas City, Oregon, uh, towns like that that really never materialized. Now, meanwhile, Maumee City, Perrysburg, they were actually ports for Lake Trade. Uh, the waterfronts of both of these communities actually had docks, warehouses, and shipyards. Uh, James Walcott, who built the Walcott House, which is now a museum in Maumee, uh, he had a shipyard and he had steamboats in regular operation on the river and the lake. However, there was one thing that would eventually ensure success for the downriver communities, and that is the fact that about two miles downriver from the maumee Perrysburg Bridge, there is a solid limestone ledge which extends right across the riverbed and as your lake vessels began to be designed and built larger requiring a deeper draft they began to encounter problems during late summer or in the fall when the river level would normally drop and they could not reach those communities the town efforts are tied consistently to transportation efforts uh, B.F. Stickney, uh, a figure of considerable uh, local fame or notoriety because of his part in the, uh, the famous Border Wars, and uh, the, the way he named his sons, one, two, three, and, and so on, a rather colorful figure, but uh, Stickney was one of these uh, promoters uh, who saw the, the possibility of canals, and if canals could be tied into Lake Erie, and there was going to be a commercial center somewhere. He had been an Indian agent in Fort Wayne, and he had studied canals and was very much interested in the Erie Canal in New York State. And he knew that the possibility was, was very good that there could be a canal built rather easily from the Maumee River to connect with the Wabash River and even to go south to Cincinnati. And he began looking at the land and studying it, and he decided that Toledo would be the uh, spot. It wasn't, of course, Toledo then, but he decided that the canal should start here to go inland. So he enlisted the, the support of all kinds of people. Uh, there's a revealing letter from uh, DeWitt Clinton to Stickney uh, to the effect that uh, your canal programs in, um, in Indiana um, have shown me the way to get out of the Great Lakes. Uh, I found the way into the Great Lakes. Uh, you have shown me the way to, to get out. And this is an important point when we're talking about the canals, because many of our most influential 
and successful early pioneers here in Toledo were New Yorkers. And the fact of the matter is that they had seen the success of the Erie Canal in New York State. And they wanted to get in on the ground floor of the development here on the west end of Lake Erie because they knew what potential there would be for the future. And so our first mayor was John Burdan, a New Yorker, uh, Edward Bissell, a New Yorker, who was very instrumental in laying out this town of Vistula. Our first millionaire, Valentine Ketchum, was a New Yorker as well. Stickney had purchased land in the Port Lawrence uh, platting, and then he had, of course, gotten tired of uh, Port Lawrence and inactivity and decided that he could do better on his own. And he owned a large farm just to the north of uh, Port Lawrence. So he started his own town called Vistula. Vistula and Port Lawrence still were not what you'd call great financial successes. Both of these villages failed to attract a great deal of commerce from the lake. The early leaders of these communities were rather downhearted to see many of the vessels from Lake Erie go right on pass, heading upriver for Maumee, Perrysburg. <clears throat> and even the mail delivery to Port Lawrence was rather spotty because the regular mail route was from Maumee City right along what is now Detroit Avenue to Detroit on a regular basis, and they would drop the mail for Port Lawrence off in this little village of Tremainsville, which was where Detroit Avenue crossed the Ottawa River. And then once a week, they'd, they'd bring the mail into Port Lawrence along what is now Cherry Street. Well, the two communities realized that if they were going to survive, they'd better forget their competitive spirit and their rivalry, and they'd better join together. And in the fall of 1833, the citizens of both towns had met in a public meeting, and they agreed that the best thing would be to merge into one town. And neither town was willing to accept the other town's name, so they had to think of a completely new name for, for the new town. And there are at least four theories as to who suggested that the town should be called Toledo. I think it's, it's not, uh, there's no doubt that it was from Toledo, Spain. But the question of who suggested it and why, I don't think can ever be answered. My notion is that all the stories are wrong, you know, all the accepted stories. And there is one account that says when they were uh, planning the consolidation of Port Lawrence and Vistula, somebody said, uh, why not uh, name the place Toledo? And um, well, natural enough, because these kind of promotional sites were named after great cities. You have all kinds of New Madrids, or I don't know how many New Madrids, but there is a New Madrid or a New Madrid, as it's called in Missouri. Uh, uh, Baalbecks, uh, Palmyras, Rome's, um, uh, any number of you know ancient and world cities were were picked as names. Uh, Toledo was one of the successful ones. And the most logical point here is the fact that Washington Irving was the most widely read writer in the United States in that time period. And he had published a few years before his tales of the Alhambra about his visit to Spain. And uh, he had been researching the life of Christopher Columbus over in the Spanish archives. And in this book, of course, there is mention of the very historic and old city of Toledo. Well, these early pioneers undoubtedly searching for some unique name happened upon that, and the name was suggested, and that is what we became, Toledo. Uh, when the actual merger occurred is another thing that I have not really settled satisfactorily for myself. As late as 1835, the proprietors of the two towns were still disposing of their interests and dividing up their land and still referring to the towns as Port Lawrence and Vistula. There is a beautiful old map over in the library's local history collection which shows a map of Ohio placing Toledo, you might say, in Michigan. And then it says right on it, Port Lawrence or Toledo. In other words, the cartographer isn't quite sure what we want to be called at this point. 
And of course, uh, it is a certainty by 1835 because the boundary dispute is called the Toledo War. <laughs> the infamous Toledo War, which really, really wasn't uh, a war per se. Uh, I don't know whether there was <clears throat> certainly any battles even. There were some fisticuffs, I suppose. But it all arose over the discrepancy between the uh, the two lines that were drawn, the Harris line and the Fulton line, being drawn uh, basically from the lower part of Lake Michigan across uh, to Lake Erie. And one of the lines, the northern line, uh, had Toledo in Ohio, but the southern line, which basically ran across and ran through about where Southwick Shopping Center is today, had Toledo in Michigan. So there was a tremendous uh, rivalry there, particularly when the canals are being talked about and the terminus, the northern terminus of this great Miami and Erie Canal was to be at Manhattan, which, or Toledo, which at that time would have been in Michigan. The war actually started with the uh, Northwest Ordinance in uh, 1787. The Northwest Ordinance was the law that, that governed the formation of states and it, it set the boundaries and it, it set out the restrictions and it, everything was very carefully provided for in the Northwest Ordinance. However, when they formed the state of Ohio, they departed from the Northwest Ordinance in two ways. They did not take in Michigan initially as the ordinance stated they should. Uh, Michigan became a territory separate from the state of Ohio. And they went with the ordinance line, but they decided themselves that Congress really meant to include the mouth of the Maumee River in Ohio. They just hadn't had the advantage of knowing for sure where that boundary line would be. I might add that, in a sense, Ohio did have a claim which could be made, because in the early determination of the northern boundary line of Ohio, the boundary line was to be drawn from the southern point of Lake Michigan due east to Lake Erie. As they had anticipated at that early time, that would have placed the entire mouth of the Maumee River within the bounds of Ohio. But they were using faulty maps. And as they later realized, uh, Lake Michigan extended farther south than they really knew it to be at that time. And as it was, they extended the boundary line according to that early description. And that place, Port Lawrence, or of course then Toledo, in the Michigan Territory. So from 1803 until 1835, Michigan assumed that they owned the Toledo area. And jurisdiction was in Michigan. And when um, Port Lawrence, the second platting of Port Lawrence, was made in 1832. It was entered as a subdivision or a plat or however they did it. It was registered, I guess, um, in Monroe County, Michigan, because Michigan was, was assuming um, jurisdiction in the Toledo area. And Michigan's had no taxes, and Ohio did, so people thought that was fine. Until it was announced that the Ohio legislature was going to be extending the Wabash and Erie Canal project from Indiana to the Maumee River. Now, that caused great alarm among these early pioneers here in the Toledo area because they realized the state of Ohio was certainly not going to construct a canal at their expense and have that canal end in Michigan to benefit a Michigan community. And Stickney had quite a lot at stake. So according to Stickney himself, he persuaded the Michigan legislature to pass the Pains and Penalties Act, which said that if uh, any Ohio had asserted itself over the territory, and Michigan then responded and said anyone who sympathizes with Ohio who participates in an Ohio election, who aids Ohio militia, who does anything like that, can be arrested and they'll do time at hard labor. And, and uh, Stickney had surmised that if Michigan did this, Ohio would then retaliate and bring out the militia and they would force the issue. It worked. Uh, it was Governor Lucas that was the governor of Ohio at the time actually called up a militia reportedly of 
10,000 men uh, to make sure that the Michiganders did not come and uh, try to thwart the law. Uh, there were attempts, of course, to rerun the boundary line for Ohio, and Governor Lucas escorted the line runners up from Columbus. And the interesting thing is, uh, much of the Ohio volunteer force seemed to always stay at Perrysburg at this time. Uh, they would make a lot of noise. There'd be a lot of, you might say, verbal saber rattling between Ohio and Michigan, but uh, they would always use the Maumee River as a good barrier. The uh, Michigan militia would nip down into Toledo and pick up people who had participated in elections and who were uh, sympathetic to Ohio, and then the Ohio militia was in town, and um, it never came to actual warfare. It, it was mostly kidnapping prominent citizens. This brought the only casualty of the so-called Toledo War when a deputy sheriff from Monroe was attempting to arrest old Benjamin F. Stickney, who was one of the rabble-rousers in the boundary dispute. His son, too, Stickney, pulled a knife and stabbed the deputy. Fortunately, it was not a fatal wound. Two then beat it across the Maumee River and to the safety of Columbus and Governor Lucas. But the Michigan authorities, they took old Benjamin F. up to uh, the Monroe County Jail to cool his heels. And according to one account, he was quite cantankerous along the way, attempting to fall off the horse until they tied his ankles together beneath the animal and suggested if he tried to fall off again, he would have to continue the ride in whatever position he happened to end up in. Well, of course, Governor Mason demanded the extradition of two Stickney to Michigan to stand trial for the assault on the Michigan deputy. And Governor Lucas responded, of course, how could this be when this alleged attack took place in Ohio, you see? So we're right back at square one. The Congress was supposedly making a decision, but nothing was coming very quickly. So um, Governor Lucas had, had been in contact with President Jackson, and he had agreed not to engage in any more hostilities because there would be a decision coming. And so he sent his militia home, and everything was to be calm while they waited for the decision. But they had formed Lucas County in uh, June, I believe, of 1835, and as part of the uh, circumstances of erecting a county, you had to hold Common Pleas Court. Then the county would, would be official, and they had directed that Common Pleas Court be opened on the morning of September 7, 1835, in Toledo, in order to uh, assert themselves and, and secure the position as a new county. Governor Lucas did not wished to have bloodshed because he knew that Governor Mason was vowing that there would be no court session uh, on behalf of Lucas County, Ohio, held in Toledo. And so what Governor Lucas did was a rather clever stroke. He ordered that the newly appointed officials for the county hold their legally required meeting in Toledo but do so in the very, very early hours of that day. And so the officials then rode in on horseback from Maumee, leaving that area probably a little ahead of midnight. And then, oh, it's estimated perhaps they arrived here in Toledo about 2 a.m. Well, they held a brief meeting in the schoolhouse in Toledo, and... Uh, the officials sat behind the teacher's desk, and they appointed Dr. Horatio Conant of Maumee as the clerk. And he quickly wrote down the minutes of the meeting, which I guess lasted perhaps 15 minutes. And they signed the minutes, and he tucked the minutes in the band of his enormous top hat, which was in style at that time, and they adjourned. That was it. But they had complied with the requirement of the law which had created the county. They had held the meeting on the soil and in the territory of the new Lucas County. Then they realized we have no witnesses other than ourselves to the fact that we have been in Toledo to hold this meeting. 
So they went from their adjournment over to a nearby tavern, and there they signed the register in the tavern, and they also celebrated a bit the creation of the new county. And then that's about the time someone decided to have some fellows, and they rushed in the door and hollered that the Michiganians were coming. <laughs> well, they all beat it for their horses as fast as possible. And in this mad dash to get out of Toledo, uh, these are our early officials of the county, please note, and they are quickly retreating back all the way to Perrysburg <laughs> to get out of the disputed strip because they don't want any trouble with the Michigan authorities. But uh, in this mad dash to retreat, Dr. Conant's hat was knocked off and the precious document with the minutes, they happened, that happened to be lost. And so some of them had to go back and retrace their steps until they found the hat and the minutes of the meeting. And so <laughs> all was saved. But actually there were no Michigan militia in the area at all. They were camped uh, in Monroe, I guess. And they were planning to be here in the morning so that they could stop the court. So they rode into town the first thing in the morning and they were really disappointed that they didn't find any Ohio soldiers around as they had planned on. Michigan men thought, we're going to have a fight today. This is going to be fun. And there were no soldiers here. You know, big disappointment. They gave a war and, and nobody came. So they hung around for about three days drinking and plundering people's gardens and carousing. And then they went home. Congress actually brought an end to the whole affair. In a sense, it was almost outright political bribery. Uh, the Michigan authorities were told that if you wish to become a state, you are going to have to forfeit the Toledo Strip. As a consolation prize, so to speak, Michigan was awarded the Upper Peninsula uh, by the Congress, and um, so that's how it ended. By 1836, they had decided they needed a government here, so they petitioned then to have a city government and be incorporated as a city. So, of course, the Ohio legislature passed the act, uh, well, the governor signed the act on January 7th, 1837. They came to Toledo, a city.